So last time we talked a little bit about deep learning, the big picture. Then we talked about stochastic gradient descent. We mentioned that we cannot use second order methods because it's slow to compute, basically to backpropagate D times through deep neural networks because that's not cheap. That's why we have to live with gradients. We cannot use Hessians. Then we talked a little bit about momentum. Then we said, how can we accelerate momentum or make it more careful actually? Then we said the learning rates could be adaptive. And there is a way of making them adaptive by looking at the gradient, the past summation over the gradients. And that was Adagrad. And the problem with Adagrad was that it keeps growing. We keep adding more and more terms that are positive. That's why towards the end of the training, the algorithm is gonna stop prematurely before it reaches the actual minimum. Then we said, uh, how about we take an average of the most recent history? The average, you could uh, store the gradients for let's say a window of size, I don't know, 10, 10 past gradients that you choose from. But uh, there is a smarter way of doing that because that one you have to store huge numbers and you have to store, I don't know, 50 of them or 10 of them to compute your averages. A better way is to store only one number or one set of numbers, a vector, and keep updating that. It's called exponential moving average. And we are keeping a moving average. This is just a notation of the expected value or the mean at time t, which is perhaps 90% of your mean from last time, plus 10% uh, of the gradients that you are that you're computing in this iteration using your mini batch. There are two cool things that are happening. The gradients are gonna be noisy. This is gonna help you denoise your gradients. It's basically a moving average. And at the same time, it's gonna help you make your learning rate adaptive. So it has two benefits. And we said now, we can just define delta t and explain everything in terms of delta t. Even at a grad, we could have written it in terms of delta t. Delta t is equal to negative eta divided by a square root of gt plus epsilon. So now you can write your algorithms in terms of delta t to save some notation. And this is just uh, one option. You could use that. And that's a perfectly valid way of uh, taking steps in the direction of your average gradients or gradients. But there is a problem here. You have the same problem also here. The dimension or the units of delta theta t, let's say theta t is in terms of meters. Let's give it a unit. Delta T is gonna be meters per second. Delta theta T is gonna be in terms of meters per second. The gradient is gonna be meters per second. The square root of the averages that you're doing is gonna be meters per second. If you divide meters by, per second by meters per second, the dimension of the left side and the right side don't match. They don't have the same units. One of them is a unit less number. The other one has a unit.
the question is what is eta? Eta here was actually our uh, initial value for the learning rate. But as the algorithm adapts its learning rate, it's gonna keep changing its learning rate and finding the best one. Now, since the units don't match, the people who wrote the paper of Ada Delta, they said, we can keep a running average of delta t as well from the previous iteration. The current delta t, you don't know it, but the previous one you know, and you can have a running average of delta t minus one. The same way that you have a running average here, you can have a running average of delta t's. Here you have a running average of your gradients, but you can also have a running average of your delta t's, delta theta t's. And another thing to note is that this is just square root of the mean of the gradient squares. So it's just root mean square of your gradients. The same way you, have, you can have root mean squares of your delta t's, but at previous times, this is just an estimate for delta t. This way, you can actually get rid of your eta. So the cool thing about other delta is that you don't even need to specify your learning rate. So that's an advantage. So it was around the same time that Jeffrey Hinton, the father of modern deep learning, was advocating for a similar method for optimizing for training neural networks, but he never got to publish it. He just put a video online on Coursera, and now the video is on YouTube. And you're more than welcome to watch that video. So Jeffrey Hinton is really good at explaining things, much better than what I'm doing here. And he was calling the algorithm RMS prop. Prop is for proportion. And RMS is root mean squares. As you can see, it's very similar. You just have a running average. Now, these are the numbers that you choose. And this is actually a good number to choose from. 0.9, 90% of your previous gradients is actually a good one. And uh, If you look at it, it's very similar to Ada Delta, but without taking their running average of Delta T's. So these are a couple of adaptive methods that were introduced before Adam. Looks like RMS prop is just Ada Delta with 0.9 filled in for gamma. That's one change. Actually, for gamma, you can put it to be 0.9. And actually, in other delta, you put it to be 0.9. The other change is eta. For other delta, eta is just a root mean squared error, root mean squares of your delta thetas. So for Ada Delta, you don't have to specify your eta, but here for RMS prop, you have to specify it. Got it, okay. But you're right, these two methods are very similar. And the idea is generalizing Ada Graph and taking care of the problems with Ada Graph. Perfect, and now let's continue. Then people said the same way that you are keeping a running average of your gradient squares, you can keep a running average of your gradients. 
and that's going to give you some similarities with momentum. Basically, these are momentumless at a grad, at a delta, and RMS prop. There is no momentum. They just have adaptive learning rates. Adam is going to introduce momentum as well. So you take a running average of your gradients and another running average of your gradient squares. These are the hyperparameters that you choose. I think one of them is 0 0.99, the other one is 0 0.999. So very numbers that are really close to one. One advantage is that now your gradients are gonna become noiseless. You're taking variance away from your data, from your gradients. The other advantage is introducing momentum and VT is gonna help you make things adaptive. The problem with MT and VT is that they are gonna start with zero, from zero. So initially during training, you're ignoring your gradients there is bias towards zero. Because if this guy is zero, then there is a huge bias. These numbers are huge. They are close to one. And you're basically ignoring your gradients when you start your training. That's why you have to take away your bias. So this number, one minus beta one to the power t, if t is, uh, huge towards the end of the training. This is a number less than one to the power of a number that's big. So that one is gonna go to zero. And towards the end of the training, MT hat is just MT. Same thing for VT, because beta two is a number less than one. So VT hat is just VT. But initially, these numbers are gonna be close to one and they're gonna help you give more emphasis to GT and GT square. So it's gonna unbias your estimates for the running averages. So there is a bias towards zero, you're unbiasing that. And once you do that, the rest of it is very similar to add a grad and add a delta and RMS prop. Instead of the gradients, you just put the moving average of your gradients. And this term is to get rid of, uh, is actually to make your method adaptive, your learning rate adaptive. Usually a good number for eta is 10 to the power negative three. But depending on the neural network that you have, you might change those options. So in the same paper, in the same Adam paper, this Adam paper is a paper on archive. And I want you to check the number of citations that it's getting because many people are using it. That's the first method of choice for optimizing deep neural networks currently. The same paper introduced at a max, where rather than using the L2 norm here, this is sort of L2 norm, you can put the L infinity norm for your VTs. So this term, UT, is very similar to VT then you have whatever that's left from before. It's very similar to this term. And you are taking the max of whatever that you had previously and the absolute value of your gradient now. And then the rest of it is similar to what you had here. The cool thing is that now we don't have to add the epsilon. because you're always having a number that's bigger than zero. Either this number is 
bigger than zero or this number is bigger than zero, and you are taking the maximum of the two. So you don't need to add the epsilon here, the epsilon term. And to be clear, so beta two, ut minus one is a vector. So is this pointwise maximization or exactly. element pointwise? Yes. So this is a vector, ut minus one. This is another vector. And at each entry, you take the, the maximum in the i position of either and the maximum in the i plus first position and so on. Exactly. So in the first position of the outcome, you are going to put the maximum of these two terms of that entry. Then the second entry, you take the maximum. That's going to give you the second entry and so on. So yeah, in deep learning, uh, we use a lot of pointwise operations. Whenever you have your activation function, that's gonna act pointwise. So most of your operations are gonna be pointwise. Unless I tell you it's not. So your default thought should be that it's pointwise, it's elementwise unless the paper or the method or the code tells you otherwise. So the idea of NADAM is N stands for Nestrov. The thing is that you want to introduce Nestrov ideas and the idea of looking forward before making decisions into Adam. So Adam is like momentum. Nestrov, you need to find a way to introduce looking ahead. So you need to change this gradient. So the way that you do it, is this way. So as you can see, up until this point, you have eta square root of v t plus epsilon. But now this term is trying to look ahead. So if you write down the math, and if you take a look at the paper, you see the exact details of what is going on here. But the idea is you want to take a look ahead of yourself and then take a step. So there is a question from Jacob. How important is our choice of gradient descent algorithms? For instance, will Adam Max give substantially different results than RMS prop? Why am I introducing all of these methods to you? Because first, whenever you read a paper, they're gonna use one of them. Why is that? Why is there not a consensus of which method to use? is because deep learning, deep neural networks are totally different from each other. One of them are, some of them are RNN, some of them are uh, convolutional neural networks, some of them are fully connected, and each one is gonna behave differently. That's why usually in uh, Python frameworks that you are gonna deal with, for instance, in TensorFlow, you have all of these options that you can choose from. Or in PyTorch, you can choose from one of these. So there is no consensus on, on which one is gonna work better than the other one. And the answer is yes. Sometimes Adamax behaves totally different from RMS prop. Are there any accelerate, accelerated stochastic methods. So yes, this NADAM and ADAM that you see, they are accelerated. Why? Because you have a momentum term. But if, but if by accelerated you mean second order, no, that's not gonna happen. Unless you find some efficient way of doing backpropagation and computing Hessian in high dimensions. Yes, so these are momentum. The first summation 
the first running average, then Adam is gonna give you the momentum. The second one is for making your learning rates adaptive. The cool thing about Adam is that this theta that you choose is the maximum step that your algorithm is gonna take. So it's not gonna overshoot beyond theta. And all of these methods are stochastic because of the batching, the mini batching that you were talking about at the start with stochastic gradient descent. Yes, all of them are stochastic. So it's a stochastic momentum, a stochastic nest trough, a stochastic at a grab, a stochastic at a delta, and so on. All of them are stochastic. Any other questions? So yeah, if you compare NADAM to ADAM, this is what you get. The only difference is that in NADAM, you are putting MT hat here. In ADAM, it's MT minus one. So the formula here is just a reformulation of what you see up there. Basically, you plug in MT, MT hat inside your term here, and that's what you get down here. So the only difference between Adam and Nadam is that you're looking ahead before making a decision. Will we cover examples of when it is appropriate to use each algorithm? Yes. So up until this point, I wanted to get gradient descent optimization algorithms out of our way. And the rest of the course is gonna be basically examples. And it's gonna be application oriented as the title of the course says. So it's applied deep learning. But I had to introduce these methods because you're gonna see them in papers. You're gonna read about them in papers and I want you to know what you're actually using. And it's gonna give you a big picture of what algorithms, what is the underlying algorithm. And there is a, this field is a huge field if you want to do research. And as you can see, it's very fundamental. It's the compiler of deep learning. That's the only place that you're actually designing an algorithm. And the algorithmic way of thinking of an applied mathematician or a statistician is gonna be helpful here. The rest of it is deep learning writing and algorithms itself. Basically data is gonna write algorithms. Okay, let's move on. 